happy Monday. Happy day Happy after Monday. Mother's Day. Shout out to all the moms out there. Um, <laughs> we that, hope you have an amazing weekend filled with joy and love and laughter. Um, all of you mothers deserve it. So happy Mother's Day say to that. you all. <laughs> so if this is your first time with us here on the Monday Rundown, welcome. Go ahead and put a one in the chat so we can shout you out. But we love the Monday Rundowns because... Winston over there and I get to talk about all the things that we don't get to talk about on our Wednesday shows. We love to hear from content creators and other thought thought leaders about the different topics that we talk about. And today is just another example of one of those days where we get to learn and grow. Absolutely. So let's jump into today's topic. Is inequality inevitable? Hmm. So... I, I, I'm the committed optimist and I think about, I think about, <laughs> we've talked about Star Trek before. If Star Trek can become a, a reality, the world that is built in Star Trek is everybody has access to food. Everybody has access to a home, um, the money that they need to live. There's not like, there's not this like, uh, competitiveness in order to get money and things and like have like a better life than another person. It's just, you have all the things that you need. And with that, how would you explore the things that you really love? What are the things that like you're really passionate about and you get into them? So if you're really into farming, like guess what? You get to be a farmer without worrying about how you're going to pay for water and to keep the lights on or whatever, right? Like you can just farm. If you love to explore the unknown, you get to be the captain of a spaceship, right? Um, so if humans can do that, literally poverty and homelessness and um, uh, access to food or the, un mm -hmm. the inability to have access to food, all of that is not a thing anymore. And if we, if we could create that world that is created in Star Trek, I think that like inequality in the way in which we think about it, I think would be gone. Can we do it? This is such a, Can we do uh, it? I don't know. I don't know. I think that maybe that's the bigger question. And um, I don't know. I'm a committed optimist. It may not happen in my lifetime. I'll just say it that way. It may not happen in my lifetime. I would love to. Uh, no. yeah. This is so funny. I actually, so I think the answer is no. Or I think is I think inequality is inevitable because I don't think we actually want to be equal. Um, this is so interesting. I think so much of the things that drive us to do things in life um, come from this sense of getting, receiving joy or a, an emotional response that demands more. So it's like if you, and I, I'm going to relate things to fitness, but it's like I think of a person who's strong and my desire to, to be stronger some of that motivation may come from wanting to be stronger than someone else as much as it's being stronger than myself like how i then and what i was i feel like we look at other people and use that like i want to be stronger than him or her and use that as motivation right i think there are people who are competitive in that way and like to compare in that way and then there are other people who just see others as different you are not better than me i am not worse than you we're just different oh see but those are interesting words because i said stronger but it doesn't make me better so okay the ability to do something okay. more than someone else and that's the interesting thing i think the choice of words that we use simply because i'm able to do something doesn't make me better and, and that's where i i feel like much of what's wrong with trying to pursue certain things get warped because just because i want to be stronger and I, I know I'm using, because I said, than someone else. That's yeah, where the comparative that's aspect feels. come in. Yeah. And yet, and yet it doesn't, just because I'm comparing myself, it doesn't then have to also denote better or worse in, in my mind. Sorry about that. So I think it's the competitive nature. If you're comparing yourself to someone else, it does become a better or worse. If you're comparing yourself to yourself, I'm this strong now. Next month, I want to be stronger. To me, then then if you're comparing yourself, then it's just like, okay, then it's you against you. And it's not like, oh, look at that guy over there. 
I don't want to be, I, I want to be stronger than that guy over there. That, that creates that is, a level of like, I am better than you mentality. No, I think, I think because easily. that's what we've been taught that, but that's what I'm saying. But that's the part that we've been taught. The fact that someone's faster, but does it, because better to me denotes a whole slew of things that doesn't involve what I'm using to judge myself on. Just because I'm faster than someone doesn't mean I cook any better. Doesn't mean I do a, a ton of other things, but it, in, in an area that I may be able to delineate some advantage or comparative advantage, doesn't now. And that's why I said, I think it's because we then choose to use the term better. That improvement doesn't have to make me something else less. Just because I improve doesn't have to make and anyone my else unique and different. Like conversation, I think though, if if you're looking, if if people in general are looking at something like I want more, more than who, more than what you currently have now, or more than somebody else, and does that mean that we are now? You're talking about an equality in general, like I am not equal to the person next to me. That to me is just different, right? Like we're just unique and different. We're not equal, we're different versus an access to things like food, light, water. Like to me that it's like, um, that's, it's like the better, the le and I think that's the kind of world we live in right now where there's a lot of people fighting for access to. Yeah, but so, yeah, yeah, and okay. Because some of that to me then denotes, I mean, there's certain places where you won't, you can't get certain things to certain places. And if the infrastructure, I know the infrastructure right now is not set up that way. Because there is an advantage, obviously, for some to not have and others for, for others to have. So I, I know you're, I, we use the example of Star Trek. And in my mind, it's, but even in that world where people were given the, I mean, the ability literally to go to a machine and ask it for food, they still did all types of shady stuff. <laughs> it's like, it's a, they started stealing replicators and, and taking the replicators. Like, I'm not even going to get into it, but I, if you're a Trekkie, you know the episode I'm talking about. <laughs> And then that's probably one of those parallel universes where they bucked into like humans from the past who were like, mine, 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 mine. I got to steal this. Anyway, look, it's not just us. <laughs> I think we should actually hear from some others. I think it'll this help a good give one. all of us some context. We are bringing to the, for the first time, a TEDx, some education from the TED community. Um, I'm really interested to hear what they've got to say and what we can all learn from it. So let's get into that. Let me pull that let's up for everyone. Here we go. In South Africa, one of the most unequal countries in the world, the richest one-tenth of one percent owns almost 30 percent of all the country's wealth, more than double what the bottom 90% owns. Income and wealth inequality are not new. In fact, economists and historians who've charted economic inequality throughout history haven't found a single society without it. Which raises a bleak question. Is inequality inevitable? One way to estimate inequality is with a number called the Gini Index, which is calculated by comparing the income or wealth distribution of a perfectly equal society to the actual income or wealth distribution. The area of this shape multiplied by two is the Gini index. A Gini of one indicates perfect inequality. One person has everything and everyone else has nothing. You'd never see this in real life because everyone except that one person would starve. A Gini index of zero indicates perfect equality. Everyone has exactly the same income or wealth. But you also never see this in real life, not even in communist countries, because for one thing, that would mean paying everyone, no matter how young, old, what job they're in, or where they work, the exact same wage. Typical after-tax genies in developed countries today are around 0.3, though there's a wide range from pretty equal to pretty unequal. Before we go any further, you should know what the Gini index or any other measure of economic inequality doesn't tell us. It gives no information about how income and wealth are distributed across genders, races, educational backgrounds, or other demographics. It doesn't tell us how easy or difficult it is to escape poverty. 
and it also gives no insight as to how a particular society arrived at its present level of inequality. Economic inequality is deeply entangled with other types of inequality. For example, generations of discrimination, imperialism, and colonialism created deeply rooted power and class inequalities that persist to this day. But we still need at least a rough measure of who gets how much in a country. That's what the Gini Index gives us. Some countries are economically much more unequal than others, and that's because a significant portion of economic inequality is the result of choices that governments make. Let's talk about some of these choices. First, what kind of economy to use? In the 20th century, some countries switched to socialism or communism for a variety of reasons, including reducing economic inequality. And these changes did dramatically reduce economic inequality in the two largest non-capitalist economies, China and the Soviet Union, especially in the Soviet Union. But neither country prospered as much as the world's leading economies. So yes, people earned about as much as their neighbors did, but that wasn't very much. This and many other issues contributed to the Soviet Union's collapse in 1991, and China, to grow more quickly, shifted its economy towards capitalism starting in the late 1970s. What about capitalist countries? Can they choose to reduce economic inequality? It's tempting to think, <laughs> no, because the whole point of capitalism is to hoard enough gold coins to be able to dive into them like Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> China seems to provide the textbook example of this. After it became more capitalist, its Gini index shot up from under 0.4 to over 0.55. Meanwhile, its per capita yearly income jumped from the rough equivalent of $1,500 to over $13,000. But there are many counterexamples, capitalist countries in which inequality is actually holding steady or decreasing. France has kept its Gini index below 0.32 since 1979. Ireland's Gini has been trending mostly downward since 1995. The Netherlands and Denmark have kept theirs below 0.28 since the 1980s. How do they do it? One way is with taxes. Personal income taxes in most countries are progressive. The more money you make, the higher your tax rate. And the more progressive your tax system, the more it reduces inequality. So for example, while pre-tax income inequality in France is roughly the same as it is in the US, post-tax inequality in France is roughly 20% lower. Meanwhile, inheritance taxes can reduce the amount of wealth that a single family can amass over generations. Germany and many other European countries have inheritance or estate taxes that kick in at a few thousand to a few hundred thousand euros, depending on who's inheriting. The US, on the other hand, lets you inherit $12 million without paying any federal tax. Another way is with transfers, when the government takes tax revenues from one group of people and gives it to another. For example, social security programs tax people who work and use the revenue to support retirees. In Italy, about a quarter of Italians' disposable household income comes from government transfers. That's a lot, especially relative to the U.S., where the figure is just over 5%. Oh. A third way is to ensure that everyone has access to things like education and health care. A highly educated, healthy workforce can command a higher salary on the market, thus reducing inequality. A fourth way is addressing the digital divide, the gap between those who have access to the Internet and those who do not. A fifth way is dealing with extreme wealth. Multi-billionaires can buy social media platforms, news outlets, policy think tanks, perhaps even politicians, and bend them to their will, threatening the very fabric of democracy. Now, we are just barely scratching the surface of inequality here. We haven't touched on the drastic divides in who has wealth and who doesn't, the power structures that prevent social and economic mobility, and the drastic inequality between countries. The fact that, for example, just three Americans have 90 billion more dollars than Egypt, a country of 100 million people. And here's one final thing to think about. Power and wealth are self-reinforcing, which means that equality is not. Left to their own devices, societies tend toward inequality, unless we weaken the feedback loops of wealth and power concentration. But will capitalism allow for these kinds of adjustments, or is it fundamentally broken? Explore the answer to this question with this video, or continue to expand your understanding of economics on the World Economic Forum's YouTube channel. Okay. So I really appreciated that breakdown. They didn't they didn't steer away from um, 
the complexities of financial inequality, like gender, country, race, ethnicity, all that, religion even, right? Like, um, and how those also play into um, the current status. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love having a genie index to kind of at least give you a benchmark as to like where you are. Um, well, I, I'm happy you brought that up because so for the U.S., for anyone, oh. I know we talk a, a global nation, but yeah. the genie index decreased by 1.2 between 2021, 2022, which is you could see the percentages there and they were sharing what it was earlier for those other places. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is actually funny because this is the first time since 2007. The Gini index has decreased. Does you Do you think that's because, let's think about this in terms of context. I'm sure it's going to take a while for them to find the evidence for this. This is a post-COVID time where mm-hmm. a lot of people started doing entrepreneurial things. There was a lot of talk about a massive um, passing of wealth and how like there were going to be more millionaires let's just say in the U S I won't even talk about the rest of the world, but there are going to be more millionaires made like in, in that, in those coming years than there had ever been before, like just mm-hmm. a higher distribution of wealth because people had access to things like the internet. I even loved how they talked about that. Like if you have a healthy and educated workforce, right? Like that's going to impact those factors as well. Like, and Wi-Fi, right? So you have all these mm-hmm. people who have access to the internet and now can make money in digital spaces what maybe some would call like a gig a gig economy that is now distributing the wealth in a way that it wasn't able to before. I wonder, I just, I don't know if we'll have answers for this, but I, I'm. No, no, no. I mean, you're, def- you're hitting on it right now. And they do have, they have the statistics to show that the dot com, the era that you're looking at, I mean, from 2007, the internet absolutely blew up. Um, and to your point, you have had, I mean, I guess with the fact that they're choosing to point out the decrease, just what's happened recently, um, I think what we were looking at numbers trending this way for quite some time now. You know what I mean? A lot of people who have been making a significant amount of money. And then you have things like AI, which is, I know maybe we're discussing it more now, but those that, that stuff has been there now for 20 years. I mean, being implemented into different companies. I actually saw a video. It's actually so funny of um what's the name of the the guy from black one of the guys from black eyed peas Mm -hmm. talking about how ai was going to be able to write songs based on words that he puts in and how he was going to be able to tell the computer to write a song for him and he was trying to explain to the other band members this is going to take us into the future and we won't even have to come into the studio anymore because this thing is going to be and i'm talking about this was back i think it was 2003 that he was doing this video, not what? something recent. Yeah. And he was telling them about how the, the AI technology was being put into like auto tuning. A lot of those things came from AI tech. The, the terminology wasn't being thrown around as um, as how it freely as it's being used right now. Uh, so yeah, I think the fact that we are now seeing this going on, I think the pandemic threw a, threw, you know, a little bit something different into the mix. Um, but the technology side of this, I think, has been playing a huge role for quite some time. This is so fascinating. Crypto, cryptocurrency. I mean, look at just the different things that have come up. You mentioned the gig economy, Uber. There's so many things that have come up in our lifetimes that just the idea of it. Yeah, if, you have- literally, if you go back, you wouldn't be able to. If I had told you some of the things, you know, that are now out there back in 2007, if I had pitched that to you, you'd have been looking at me like, what, what? Yeah, you're going to be able to go stay in someone's house. They're going to leave their keys or somewhere for you to get into their house. And you're going to be able to stay there for a little bit of time and they clean your sheets and stuff. You'd be like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, what are you saying right now? Yeah, yeah, you'd be able to rent a mansion for a couple thousand a week. Like, what? why would someone let you do that? <laughs> like, these or, are just, someone's going to drive in their you, car and pick you up after work and take you somewhere. Or could you imagine that, like, a Joe Schmo could get on the internet and like just be by become an influencer and end up making you know millions, millions of dollars. dollars yeah yeah you know what the biggest one is i remember think and if you were on here and your parents told you this how playing video games could not make you rich 
Oh, Please right. drop something in the comments for me because there's a <laughs> kid out there. I remember this is at least seven years ago. I was talking with a client of mine about a kid making easily a million dollars a year playing video games in his living in his bedroom. Well over a million dollars, actually. He'd been signed for multi million dollars. As does everybody else. How do you make money by playing video games? That's another conversation for another day, but I am willing to hear yeah, sponsorship. How that works. Say that. <laughs> <laughs> like hit us up. <laughs> <laughs> it is for sure. All right. Oh, man. This is great, guys. Um, we love the questions that you have for us. So keep bringing them. Um, please, again, if you have any thoughts, if you have a reaction to the video that we just watched together, please put that in the comments as well. We check all the Let comments. Know. And back. Until next Monday, though, as always, remember that you deserve the good life. Say that. Say that. We'll see you guys. Be well. <laughs>